of the internet topology and terminology, what the words mean that will be used in a lot of these discussions over the next few days, and uh, also an overview of the internet governance structure, that is what organizations uh, work in that space and how they fit together. So this is, on the one hand, intended to be uh, an introduction, and if you uh, came to this, but on the other hand, um, you know, all three of us have many years of expertise in our areas, and we're happy to answer questions in as much detail as you and the audience are comfortable with, and uh, we're all available afterwards and through the rest of the week to uh, answer any more detailed questions that you might have, uh, or to introduce you to other people who might be able to cover things in more detail. So with that, let me get started with the uh, introductions here. Um, first, in the uh, suit jacket there, a little more formal than the other two of us, uh, <laughs> this is Rick Lamb. Uh, Rick is presently with IANA, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, and you'll find out more about what IANA does later in the uh, session. Um, prior to that, he was at the United States uh, Department of State. He was the Internet technology expert there uh, who contributed sort of facts and reality to a lot of their policy making. And prior to that, he uh, wrote a lot of um, uh, networking software and firmware, uh, I guess, for routers and uh, um, uh, the, the IP stacks that actually make operating systems uh, send packets across the internet. So uh, a technology guy who's gotten into policy over the years. Um, Herman Valdez. Uh, was with Nick Mexico. This is the organization that was responsible for the .mx uh, country code domain name, uh, the domain name for Mexico, and also for IP address allocations within Mexico in the early days. And then when LACNIC was formed, the Latin American and Caribbean Inter Network Information Center, uh, he went there to be sort of the number two guy in that organization and helped run that for many years. And then when uh, APNIC, which is the Asia Pacific Network Information Center, uh, needed more senior staff recently, he transferred from uh, uh, Uruguay to Australia and took his family there, and they've been there for about a year now. Um, uh, myself, I'm the research <coughs> director at Packet Clearinghouse. 
we're an NGO that has worked since 1993 to uh, support critical internet infrastructure. So that means mostly the, the physical and server infrastructure at the core of the internet that if it goes down, many, many people are affected. So we don't, unlike many NGOs, we don't really provide any services at all to individual end users. We're trying to make things better by making the, the heart of the system more efficient and more cost effective. And uh, as we do that, we see the benefits uh, accrue in kind of a cumulative way to, to the users. Uh, before that, or overlapping with that, since 1989, until 2002, I ran an internet service provider in the US and Northern Europe. So let me um, start with the most basics here. What is the internet? Uh, just as kind of an example of how we'll be handling uh, questions and, and issues uh, this in this session. Um, many people describe the internet by trying to abstract it as a cloud. So. They say the internet is a cloud and stuff connects to the cloud and what happens inside the cloud is complex and you shouldn't worry about that. But in fact, the policy issues that are discussed here in the Internet Governance Forum are all about how things happen inside that cloud. So we're going to be spending a bit of the session today delving into that. Um, so really, it's not one big cloud, it's many, many small clouds and they're all interconnected with each other. So. Uh, the, the cloud metaphor is not bad if there are things that you don't want to have to think about the details of uh, abstracting them as a cloud is fine but the level of abstraction doesn't need to be quite as great as the whole internet is one cloud so specifically some definitions here the internet with a capital I proper noun is the network of networks it is the network, the global network that is formed by all the other networks that connect with each other. That term came from the word internet with a lowercase i, which just meant any network of multiple devices. Okay, so the big I internet is the network of all the networks. That's why, going back for a second, we say that the internet as a whole is a lot of little clouds that are all tied together into one big one. So. Um, now, uh, Rick Lamb will come up and uh, talk a bit about how the domain name system works, how it is that we find things on the internet. Hi, uh, I'm Rick Lamb. Uh, as Bill said, some of the, uh, it's important to understand how some of the internals of that cloud work. And uh, specifically, there are two parts of that cloud that are important. How names are looked up, how names are converted to numbers, and how the, uh, example of how to, how to browse something on the web. But uh, before I go there, I'd like to point out that understanding some of these basics is, is very important. I mean, just understanding the few basics about how the internet works can, can, can make it, can give people an uh, enormous number of opportunities. Uh, uh, I say this with some experience. I, I had a couple startups in the past, and just understanding some of the basics of how packets move across the internet and how names are looked up. Uh, wow, it's 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 really uh, <laughs> it's it's really amazing what you what, what you what you can do. Uh, just understanding how some of this stuff works. It's it's not that complicated when you get down to it. But anyway, in a hope for at least generating some uh, some uh, motivation there, I'm going to describe uh, how um, the uh, name lookup part of the um, so we'll start with the web browsing example. Um, so we'll type, type a URL or something into the web browser uh, header, uh, web browser field at first. It's called a URL, which is a um, uh, uniform resource locator. Um, there's the exact definition for it. Um, I think basically what you just need to understand is it's it's composed of um, it's composed of a couple components here. Um, the HTTP component uh, defines that it's actually uh, uh, browsing browsing the web, and the rest of that is a domain name. But we'll get into that. Okay. All right. So the entry you put on a web browser. There are many there are many services on the internet. There's there's browsing the web. There's sending email. 
there's chatting now, very popular with, among the, the younger people. Not me, but you know, a lot of the, <laughs> the younger people still like to chat on the web. So, so there are, ma there are many, uh, many, uh, many uses, of the, uses of the net. There's many ways to translate between a name and a number. Uh, this example is just for browsing uh, the net, um, which is most you know, familiar, to, to, to familiar to most of us. So we'll start with that. Um, the first part of the HTTP colon www.isoc.org is uh, the part that, that defines what this service is. And in this case, it's the hypertext transfer protocol. And, you know, a, a lot of this jargon, it's, it's not, I feel it's not important to specifically understand the, the details of each one of these, just, just what, it, what it refers to. And for HTTP, we're talking about the web. Um, and there are a bunch of protocols associated with that. That prefixes uh, the rest of a domain name. Now, this is the part that does get the translation. This is what the DNS does, the domain name. Uh, system on the net does it translates between that that name and an I and a number which will then actually be used to transfer uh, packets across the net. Uh, that's referred to as a fully qualified domain name. That's when you have the full name going all the way across there. Um, let's go to the next page. All right. And the domain name itself consists of multiple parts, um, and it's it's from right to left. Um, or, for example, um, is one of the top level domain names. Um, so at the very top you have things like org, net, com, uh, as well as country uh, level domain names. Um, so org is, the, is one of those top level domain names. All right. ISOC in this case is an example of the company uh, or business uh, name. That's the second level uh, domain name, if you will. And that's, uh, that's owned and operated by that particular company. All right. WWW, in this case, refers to a particular service on that, uh, uh, that that company operates. In this case, it'd be the uh, web server. But it could be anything else as well. So for example, if we prefix this whole thing with, instead of HTTP colon, we prefixed it with mail or mail to. Uh, that could be not www or could, it could be mail.isoc.org. Point is, it really doesn't matter what those first three letters are. Uh, it's, it depends on how the company defines it and how the company wants to use that. Okay. So when the computer looks up this domain name, um, instead of asking for each separate part like .org, .isoc, and, and www, it takes the whole domain names and sends it to a, a name server, a domain name server, which uh, will translate this into an IP address. Here's a further description of what the top level domains are. Um, like I said, in general, there are things like generic top, la generic top level domain names are .com, .net, .org, .museum, um, and, and a few others like that. And some of you may, may have heard that that ICANN is in the process of, of uh, entertaining um, the introduction of a whole bunch of new top-level domain names, a whole bunch of new GTLDs, as they're referred to, global top-level domain names. Um, and certainly, feel free to ask me about this or any of the ICANN staff, or most anyone I think is following this, uh, <laughs> about the whole GTLD process and how those top level, new top-level domain names will be developed. And that was, these GTLD, GTLDs are being um, Created in response to customer demand. Okay. Now there's also another effort in place. Um, you know, by God, I mean the world does not, you know, just use uh, uh, Roman <laughs> Roman Roman characters. All right. So uh, finally, we're introducing um, internationalized domain names. So this has been uh, a long, a long going effort with. Uh, many uh, technical groups as well as uh, uh, policy groups to do this and, and uh, we're really close. Um, and in fact, all the, all the technological components are all done. There have been some test ideas in place. This way people can type instead of .com, .net, .org, they can type something that actually they understand in their own language. So there's no, you know, there's no uh, need to be stuck in the uh, dark ages like we have been. All right. So this is a uh, analogy that's often made uh, that, uh, okay, well, domain names are just like names in a phone book. 
So all we're doing is, when you, when you call up somebody, you have to type in their phone number. Um, so, but you've got to go to a phone book to look it up. The whole idea here is the same thing. Uh, there's a public directory that people can use to convert between a name and a phone number. Um, and um, some of the terminology there in that uh, paragraph actually is important. Um, uh, and, and I'll describe some of the definitions here in, in a second. Um, when the computer resolves a domain name into an IP address, um, that's converting the, the name into a phone number, but in this case something called an internet, an IP uh, address, an internet protocol address. And that internet protocol address is uh, right now a uh, something called an, uh, an IPv4 address. It looks something like those, uh, like a set of four numbers separated by dots. Okay, and that's what we've had since the uh, start of the internet. It seemed like enough addresses at the time that we'd never run out of them. But uh, turns out we are. Uh, so another thing you'll hear a lot about during this uh, IGF is the transition from IPv4 to v6 basically just a much bigger number. And uh, however, it does have some major ramifications on the infrastructure of the net. Another term that's uh, often used in, uh, uh, amongst us internet types is a packet. So uh, when data is sent across the internet, um, it's sent in the, in the form of a packet, a, a small group of bytes that uh, is uh, easily sent across multiple, uh, multiple links and across multiple routes to uh, get to its destination. Um, this is fundamentally different from the way the phone company works, the uh, way a telephone call works. When you make a call, you build up a circuit and you create a permanent link between you and the person you're calling. The fundamental difference between the, phone comp the telephone system and the internet is the internet, these things are broken up into many small pieces. By breaking it up into many small pieces, there are, there are a number of advantages. The resource can be shared more effectively. Uh, when you make a phone call, you tie up a line, and that line is now permanently yours. No one else can use it. Uh, by breaking things up in a packet, that can be shared. Uh, it also provides for uh, many other advantages, one of which would be um, resiliency uh, to um, uh, failure. I mean, if you send packets across one link, you might be able to send these off of multiple links, so if that one link uh, for your phone call goes down. If you were doing this on the internet, you'd be breaking that up into small packets going across the internet. So one, one path goes down, there'd be multiple other paths send this across. And there have been you know, countless uh, you know, uh, products and ideas and, and uh, successful ventures based on, on that basic uh, philosophy. Uh, voice over IP, uh, for example, breaks things into packets. So. All right, and uh, when we talk about queries, when we uh, query uh, the domain name system for a IP address. We send the domain name out, uh, and uh, the query is in the form of a, usually a very small packet, which just has the question in it, the name that we want the number for, and uh, a few other bits indicating uh, what specifically we're looking for about that, uh, what piece of information we're looking for about that name. Okay. All right. So let's go to an example of a lookup. Okay, so when we type www.isoc.org um, into our web browser, first thing it does, our computer does, is asks our local domain name server, um, what's the IP address? We, we need the number for this thing, okay? So we send it to our, and usually this, this is a, a service run by our ISP. Um, this is one of the advantages of the domain name system that it distributes a lot of the work out to the ends. Another um, aspect about the uh, difference between the telephone system and the internet is that the, the internet um, tries to put a lot of the intelligence as far as possible on the ends. It distributes the work. So this allows the internet to scale really well and grow is, uh, with, uh, with almost no bound. Um, all right, so the first thing we do is we go out and we ask our ISP, what's the number for this thing so we can talk to it? All right. Our the ISP server, assuming this is the first time someone's asked for www.isoc.org, the, the first thing it does is it says, well, I don't know anything about this. So, so it asks the uh, nearest, what is called a root name server. The root name servers have information about those top level domains. So the root name servers have information about .org, .net, .com, 
dot uh, mx dot you know museum what have you okay so um, so then it, it says well I, I don't know anything about dot org it, it actually asks the root name server what uh, what if it knows the IP address for www.isoc.org the name root name server comes back and says uh, no I don't but I do know the the IP address of someone who knows more information about dot org okay all right so then the ISP's name server says, okay, well, I know where to find information about .org. I'm going to ask um, this .org name server about the full domain name, www.isoc.org, okay? The .org name server says, well, you know, I don't know anything about, I don't have the answer to you. I don't have the full IP address for, I don't have the IP address for www.isoc.org, but I do know where to find information about isoc.org. So it comes back and says, all right, Here's the IP address or the phone number for this other server that's run by the company ISOC. All right. So then our ISP's name server uh, says, "Okay, well, we'll go and ask it. Okay, we'll go ask ISOC uh, what what the IP address for www.isoc.org is." And finally, since we're asking ISOC about a server it runs, www, it knows the answer, and we finally get our IP address. Okay. And throughout this, whole, throughout this whole process, uh, it's important to note that the ISP's recursive uh, names DNS server caches this information. Caching means sa it saves the information. So a as it's learning about these things, it's learning where the root name server is, it's learning who to ask about .org, it's learning about who to ask about ISOC, it saves this information. It keeps it around for a little while, just in case someone asks again. This is a very important quality of the, 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 this whole name lookup system of the Internet. That, that it, it tries to remember the stuff, and it, this re greatly reduces the amount of traffic that uh, has to uh, be transferred between nodes. And this, this is great from, from a number of reasons. I mean, it reduces the cost of transmission, and, and it improves performance. Okay, so finally, our ISP uh, gets the IP address for the uh, web server. So at this point, it's actually ready to now directly contact that web server. So. So now we're ready to request that page. Okay, no subs, sorry about this. All right. So I can do this. All right. So at this point, um, we switch to uh, a second part. This the second part, the other part of the internet, primary part of the internet, which is called routing. So now we have the phone number for the web server and connectivity and questions, uh, queries and responses will, will um, happen from there. This is an area where Bill is most expert, and, uh, and so I think I'm going to hand it off to him. Thanks, Richard. Um, so, yeah, the next step is to route the packets between the user and the web server that they're trying to reach. And routing is just the word that we use for the decision-making process of how to get the packets from where they are to where they need to be. Uh, it's just like routing traffic on a freeway or something. At every juncture, every possible uh, choice, we have to determine what the best choice is, which direction should we go in order to get there most quickly, most efficiently. And in the internet, most quickly and most efficiently often means at the lowest cost, as opposed to, for instance, geographically closest or something. So often you see paths in the internet that don't seem like they're the most logical ones, but the reason why the traffic is taking them is because it's lower cost, not because it's shorter geographically. So uh, let's take a look at what the internet looks like. And this is a model of the internet in microcosm, not the whole internet, but all of the functional parts. So there's no piece of the internet that's not represented in this diagram. The whole internet is just like this, but with more of each of these parts in it all tied together into a big mess. So big mess is a technical term. Uh, so specifically, we've got users down here. Um, and there are a billion more users on the internet, not just the two that are 
you know, the user and the server that are in this diagram. There are two internet service providers in this diagram. There are about 4,000 more internet service providers in the world besides the two that are in this diagram. And there are two internet exchange points in this diagram. There are about 300 more internet exchange points in the world than are in this diagram. But they all behave in exactly the same way as I'm going to show you in the diagram. So there are two relationships here that, let me back this up. There are two relationships here that I think are really critical to understand. There's peering and there's transit. Okay? So if you look at the user here and the web server there, they have transit relationships with their internet service provider. At the exchange point, however, the internet service providers have, have sorry, peering relationships with each other. But internet service providers can also have transit relationships with other internet service providers. So what does that mean? Um, ah, sorry, I backed up one too many. There we go. So transit is a transaction where one party is paying another party and making it making the other party responsible for delivering the packets. This is just like if I wrote a letter and put it in an envelope, the government of India. I put the stamp on the envelope and I put it in a post box. I have paid the government, and I have made it their responsibility to deliver the letter to wherever it needs to go. Alternatively, I don't have to buy a stamp. I can just write my letter and put it in an envelope, and I can take responsibility for delivering it to wherever it needs to go. I can go, get on a scooter and, and go there myself. But that's a lot of work. You don't always want to do that work yourself. Sometimes you want to just pay to make it somebody else's problem. So if the letter I'm delivering, if packet I'm delivering is very nearby, it's more likely that I'm going to use peering to get it there. It's more likely that I'm going to just do the work myself and save the money. If it's going halfway around the world and my network doesn't go all the way around the world, I'm probably just going to pay somebody else to deal with it. So peering is an interconnection between two parties where each one lets the other one deliver packets to its customers at no cost. Okay, so let's say I want to write a letter to Rajiv, and Rajiv is, you know, somewhere halfway across town. We could meet halfway, and I would hand him the letter, and he wouldn't pay me, and I wouldn't pay him, because he was the recipient of the letter. It doesn't make sense for him to pay me to write him a letter, or for me to pay him to read it, because then, you know, we'd have to do all this bookkeeping. It's much simpler for us to just, you know, deal with each other directly. So, transit, you pay money you make it someone else's problem. Peering, there's no money, and you do the work yourself. And those are the only two kinds of relationships there are in the internet. Between, remember in the, in the beginning I showed all the little clouds that were all interconnected with each other. Those interconnections between the different networks, they only take those two, two forms. There are no other forms. Either you pay and you make it somebody else's problem, or you interconnect for free do the work yourself. That's all there is. Never gets more complicated than that. So let's take an actual example here. The user is trying to get to the web server. They're sending a query. So they send it to their internet service provider. I've colored their internet service provider red just to indicate whose infrastructure is whose in this diagram. So they send their packet to the red ISP and they've paid their ISP. So now it's the ISP's responsibility to deliver it. The ISP looks at the IP address, the internet address on the packet, and says, ah, that address belongs to a customer of the green ISP. I know how to reach the green ISP. There are three ways for me to reach the green ISP. One way is I can send the packet through transit, make it someone else's problem. But I have to pay to do that. And I'm a businessman, so I'm always going to try and save money. Another way is for me to take the packet to another place that's very far away, it's going to be very expensive. To go somewhere close at slow speed is going to be very cheap. Okay? So sending a packet a long way away, a 
So I deliver the user's packet to the green ISP at this internet exchange point in the West. The green ISP now is responsible for taking that packet and deliver delivering it to their customer because their customer is also paying. And transit and peering are bi-directional relationships. Everything in the internet has two directions to it. If you're paying for transit, you're paying to be able to deliver packets but you're also paying to be able to receive packets. Just as if you peer with someone, your relationship allows you to both send and receive packets. So the green ISP is obligated to deliver a packet to their customer because their customer's already paid for it. So they have to undertake the larger expense of bringing the packet into their network. And then they deliver it to their customer, and essentially they get paid. But their customer now has a web server, has just received a query from this user saying, give me your web page. And the server, its job is to send a web page back. So as with pretty much every transaction on the internet, it's bi-directional. They send a packet back to their ISP. Their ISP makes exactly the same decision that the red ISP did. He says, well, this packet has to go to the red network. We can go out to transit. The way it came, but that's also fairly expensive. It's not as much as transit, but it would be a long distance. Or we can deliver it to a short distance. So we make the same decision, send it to the other internet exchange point because it's closer to us in the east. And now it's the red ISP's turn to undertake the larger expense of bringing the packet into their network over the long haul. And then they deliver it to their customer and get paid. So um, sorry. So that's called hot potato routing from the children's game where you have children in a circle and they're tossing a rock. You're not, you're not supposed to eat the rock. You're supposed to get rid of it as quickly as you can. Right? So hot potato
provide conventional services, uh, which is very different uh, from uh, the service that you will provide from the internet. Therefore, there's this. Uh, them to, to fix something. Um, the ITF um, is, is made for different working groups, uh, in, 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 in including the big areas that are, um, in, that are covering different topics uh, like uh, networking, security, um, um, uh, 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 routing, and this big area are, <clears throat> um, are directed by a, by a person who are, who are described as a, as a director area, which is. Um, who goes and, and is part of the uh, the Internet Engineering Steering Group? That's this uh, IESG uh, group is the um, the responsible of the ITF day-to-day -day operations and uh, and functioning and productivity. Um, <clears throat> this this part of the section is, is full of acronyms. Um, I think in in it's in a general in a general perspective, the Internet organizations is 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 is, uh, is, is, is full of acronyms, full of concepts that that's our uh, are summarized in acronym, and we are in the kingdom of acronyms. It's, it's a problem that uh, we need to, to face and we need to memorize this, this, this uh, long list of acronyms uh, that we have in this industry. The other board that is important to describe in this organization is the Internet Architecture Board. It's a body of experts across the spectrum of the Internet um, technical knowledge who provide guidance and oversight for the ITF uh, work product. <coughs> the ITF <coughs> is a, is a uh, their meetings of the ITF is open to, to anybody. Uh, is, uh, um, most of the people that uh, attend there are network designers, researchers, vendors, operators. And um, it's, it's, a, it's, um, it's a very dynamic group. It's a very dynamic uh, organization that uh, that's, uh, allows us to, to, to keep the internet as dynamic as it is. <clears throat> there is another group. Um, that f follow this uh, the standards developed by the by the uh, by the ITF. Um, the network operation groups uh, uh, are groups of operators of networks. Uh, basically, people that um, are in charge of the operation of the internet service providers. Um, this group has been um, been proven that be to be very very uh, helpful in the moment to the, to uh, this uh, exchange uh, knowledge, uh, face network problems, and uh, and, and basically this. Um, this group is, uh, is, is made of uh, a, a very co cooperative uh, uh, work. Um, there are different groups. Um, there are, some are uh, regional, some are national. Just here, this is a, a few examples of the groups that uh, exist right now uh, around the world. We have, I think, one of the most um, uh, uh, biggest and, and also the one of the, with more tradition is NANO, which is the North American Network Operation Group. But we also have operation groups in South, uh, South Asia, Middle East. We have some uh, national groups like uh, New Zealand and Australia. Uh, recently, last year, the Latin American group also was created. So these are these um, um, uh, uh, the group that are is spreading around the world. This is a proven uh, uh, they have proven their, their, their success. Success. Also, we have the um, the exchange points operators, um, which is based of. Um, of the uh, of the uh, internet check points operators ar around the world, also is a is a very successful groups that can uh, exchange knowledge and experiences. It's also it's also worthy to mention that um, the the internet exchange uh, uh, groups is not only about the experience of having a, a internet or technical uh, group inside a, a a country, but also this they they provide a, a good experience, associative associative experience. Of different internet service providers that can get together and uh, and organize organize ourselves and and deal with uh, local issues in their countries. Also, we have the Internet General Planning Group that meets uh, a day before uh, of the ITF meeting. This uh, the, the purpose of this uh, this group is to to share in operational knowledge uh, around the globe. We have another group of people uh, organizations that deal with. Um, uh, as a user, ad, uh, user ad advocacy, the, um, I think one of the most famous and the most successful as well is, the, is ISOCS, the Internet Society, which is uh, consists of local chapters throughout the world. It's a membership-based organization. Um, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, 
um, they represent in many aspects the, the, uh, the, um, the interest of the end user and the moment of policy making and regulatory processes. Uh, ISO has a very important presence in, in, in this meeting and, and, and also in all these um, uh, uh, summits related to internet development. Also, there is the Open Ed Initiative. It's a, it's a initiative or a project made, uh, from um, the Bergman Center in Harvard, in Harvard University. Um, this is an independent monitor of censorship of transparency in the internet, protecting the end-to-end -end connectivity. We have another group of organizations which uh, ensure the, the, uh, the smooth operation of the internet, like the IANA. IANA is the, um, the center repository uh, of the IP addresses uh, in, the, in the world. The IANA distribute IP addresses to, the, uh, to other organizations based on, on regional, uh, for regional coverage. IANA also is responsible to keeping the records of the, uh, of the, uh, of the um, top, level, uh, top level domain system. They have the records of the, uh, of the operators of the .com, .org, but most importantly, the, the one for the, uh, for the uh, country code top level domains. If you need to do a change in that, in that, uh, in that records, you need to go to the IANA and go through a, a, a very uh, a strict process in order to make modifications. Also, they are responsible for the root servers uh, um, and, and the, the, um, the, the, uh, the update of the, uh, of the root servers. And they, they, are, they follow the operation through the standards developed by the ITF. ICANN is the organization that um, englobes this, uh, the functions of the, of the IANA. ICANN is the Internet Corporation and Assigned Numbers. It's an organization based in Marina del Rey in California. And um, the, the most important role of, um, of, uh, of ICANN is the, um, the, the development of the uh, politics regarding the uh, domain name uh, system. And IP addresses as well. Um, if we can, the IP addresses also play an important role in the, the smooth operation of the internet. It can be considered as a role material for the uh, internet service providers, and they need to apply for um, for these IP addresses according to a, to a, uh, according to some policies that are developed in a bottom-up process. In the frame of five organizations around the world, uh, this is the regional internet uh, registry. There are five of them. They are served uh, uh, according to a continental uh, region. The, um, we have uh, one in Latin America, one for Africa, which is Afrinic, one for Europe, which is RIPE, NCC, one for North America and part of the Caribbean, which is uh, ARIN, and one for Asia Pacific, uh, which is uh, uh, APNIC. These five organizations uh, are organized inside the NRO, the Number Risk Organization, which is the, um, the, the, the body which uh, um, allow the coordination of all these, uh, um, these IRRs. And also the, um, the other support organization is an advisory council that serves for ICANN in order to provide guidance and, and recommendations in the IP addresses topic in the, in the, in the ICANN meetings. Also, the, there is a, 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 um, some organization that support give support uh, in the operational level. Um, uh, this, here's a, a, a few examples of them. The first one is the Network Startup Resource Center, which provide training material to people who are connected their community to the internet. They are focused their operation in developing, in developing country. They can provide uh, uh, training material like books, uh, also uh, equipment, um, and they provide funds for, for sending a, a, um, speakers and, uh, and trainers to, to, to develop in areas. Uh, Packing Creek House, that is, is run by Bill, uh, also provides operational support services in the critical infrastructure and the core of the internet. Basically, are, uh, are they um, in, uh, the helping the creation of different uh, internet check points around the world, also very strongly focused in developing regions. Um, this is um, it's a very uh, noble effort. And also the, the forum of, uh, of incident response and security teams first, which coordinate the internet emergency responders around the world. They can be considered like a, something that uh, um, this is a group that are focused in security uh, issues. Um, there are different groups in different countries, uh, and they are also coordinated among, among them. I think it's, it's, it's important to mention here that um, all these organizations have very narrow and very specific responsibility. And it's, it's that 
to ensure the smooth operation, the smooth operation of internet. Um, they are not dealing with um, another aspects, another level of the internet, uh, um, uh, um, like content uh, or, or, or the social impact of the internet. The role is very specific, and their commitment are with that. It is to ensure that the internet works and is uh, and can be accessed by everybody. Um, I think that's that's all I can give you today, and happy to go for questions and discussion. Thank you. So uh, yeah, let me just. Thank you. I have a question. What is the difference between first and the third? We know there is third for the emergency response teams. There are chapters for every country, uh, for some countries, let's say. So what is the difference between first and third? So first is basically just the, indus the yeah. Global Industry Association of CERTs. Okay. So let me, uh, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm getting that I connect to. So the first one, uh, internet exchange points, you can measure the success of an internet exchange point by how much it costs to use it. Okay, the purpose of an internet exchange point is to facilitate peering, to facilitate forwarding traffic at no cost. So if it's really expensive to use, then it's failing at its primary task. So the best internet exchange points and the majority of internet exchange points are free. They cost nothing at all to use. And you're thinking, well, how do you operate anything for free? And there are two questions to that, or two, two parts to that answer. Number one is that the exchange point itself is just a location, it's a point. It's not a whole lot of infrastructure. It's just a point where internet service providers come and exchange traffic. It itself, it's just a location with a switch in it. It doesn't need a big building, it doesn't need a lot of power, it doesn't need 10 people sitting around managing it. It's just one little piece of equipment and the cooperation of a bunch of internet service providers. Um, the work that does have to be done is typically done by those internet service providers. So if you think about that, that makes sense. If you have a company and five of your competitors have companies and you own those companies and you're very strongly invested in the success of those companies, you don't really want your core competency to be outsourced. You don't really want to go hire someone else to go deal with the thing that's most important to you, your ability to deliver packets. You and the chief engineer of each of your competitors, if something needs to be changed, you'll get together and you'll change it yourself. You'll discuss it and you'll make a, a decision carefully, and you'll do it. And you're not going to make a lot of extra decisions. You know, you're not going to flail around and do things that don't need to be done. So that's why it doesn't need to cost a lot of money. The other half of the question was, uh, if I'm an internet service provider, how do I choose what internet exchange points to go to? There are about 300 internet exchange points around the world. And if we tried to go to all 300, we'd spend a huge amount of money when it would be simpler to just pay someone else to take the packet and deliver it for us. Of course, the other extreme is to connect to no internet exchange points and always pay someone else. If we always pay someone else, then we never make money. If we always do it ourselves, we wind up spending too much money. So for every internet service provider, there's a balance in between those. And it's different for every service provider because it depends on who your customers are, what kind of traffic they have, where you're located geographically, how many internet exchange points there are in your area, right? If, let's say that you're in San Francisco, California, you could connect to six different internet exchange points within 50 miles. But let's say you're in Perth, in Australia. There's only one internet exchange point within 2,000 miles, 
right? So these will these kinds of factors will, will make a huge difference in how many exchange points you connect to. But basically, you connect to as many as makes economic sense given your business case and your customers. Uh, and this varies. There are internet service providers that don't connect to any exchange points at all. They're mostly very small ones and it's difficult for them to grow without connecting to an exchange point. But once they do connect to one, they'll grow from there. And the biggest ISPs, the biggest internet service providers might connect to 30 or 40 internet exchange points. So 10% of the world they could reach directly in terms of number of exchange points. But that 10%, they would choose very carefully. So that 10% might be 70% of the internet using population. They would go to the huge exchange points in Frankfurt, and Seoul, and Tokyo, and London, and Amsterdam, right? Places where they can reach a lot of other internet service providers. What is the cost in connecting to exchange points? Uh, so if I'm very near, the cost is going to be low because speed times distance. I can get a, a piece of fiber between my network and that exchange point, and I can run that fiber at high speed at fairly low cost. But if I have to cross the ocean, that same piece of fiber, because it's so much longer, will be very expensive. I believe you were next. Um, is there a Okay. Um, uh, thanks for those wonderful presentations, by the way. That was great. Um, you mentioned there were 4,000 ISPs, which to me as an outsider sounds like a small number, right, for a global class of organizations. So can you define what you mean exactly by ISPs? I'm, I'm assuming we throw out, let's say, the brand name only ISPs, the one who yes. sell basically capacity from other ISPs. But so right. how, how do we get to the 4,000? So that's a, a tricky number to, to come up with, and I'm the one who put it on the slide, so again, I'll, <laughs> I'll take responsibility for it. Uh, the last time I looked, there were about 3,850 internet service providers that had unique routing policy that was globally visible. And that's, that's just what I'm using as, as a, a round number. Um, in terms of businesses that would define themselves as an internet service provider globally, the number would be much larger. I would guess somewhere more like 100,000 globally. But if I'm connected to the internet and I'm an internet service provider and I look out in the routing tables in the internet and I see how many other routes are available, how many ways of getting to other places in the internet, and I see how many organizations are associated with those, I'm only going to see about 4,000 right now because the other ones are smaller ones that are customers of those and that only connect to one other ISP. So is this related to the autonomous system numbers? Exactly. Okay. So um, autonomous system numbers are serial numbers that identify ISP networks. So in the beginning, when we had the big cloud made up of the little clouds, each of the little clouds has a number to identify it. That's called an autonomous system number, an ASN. And some ASNs are given out to organizations that don't really use them. You know, they, they get them because they think they might need it sometime, but they don't actually put it into the internet in use. Some of them are used by internet service providers that just buy from one other internet service provider, and so they become, in effect, subsidiary to that internet service provider until they connect to others. And they're, I think they're about you know how many ASNs have been allocated globally so far, roughly? Well, the, the fearful is, is, is getting over, so yeah. it should be uh, around 30 or between, yeah. 30, 40,000? Yeah. Yeah, so there are 30 or 40,000. 30, 30, around 30, yeah. 30, okay. So um, about one out of eight autonomous system numbers is actually in use by somebody that's big enough to look global in scale. But that means seven out of eight are either not in use or they're in use by somebody smaller. And then there are people who are even smaller than that who don't have an ASN at all. Uh, and then Salam is next. Thanks. I have uh, two questions. The first one is what is network access point? And the second one is how do the IXPs connect internationally? Or do they connect internationally? Like you said, you connect to, you know, if you're 
a smart ad if you'd like to connect to Seoul and uh, Amsterdam. Thanks. Somebody's going to have to have a question about the domain name system or IP address allocation <laughs> <That's> soon. <laughs> um, okay. So uh, uh, let's see. The how, how are internet exchange points connected, and uh, what's a network access point? Network access point (NAP) is an acronym uh, that was formed. There, there are a lot of people who, in the United States, who made jokes politically about Al Gore claiming to have invented the internet. Al Gore never claimed to invent the internet, but he was one of the principal authors of something called the NII, the National Information Infrastructure Plan. This was in the 1980s when the United States government was still paying for the internet backbone, and they were trying to figure out a way, because that was kind of a subsidy to private industry, uh, as more and more private companies started using the internet, they were trying to figure out a way of getting out of that business. And so they developed this plan called the National Information Infrastructure Plan, which had several parts to it. But ultimately, the way the internet is in the world right now looks basically like what their plan said it would almost 30 years ago. Uh, sorry, 20, <coughs> 20 years ago. <coughs> Excuse me. And internet exchange points, they didn't know what things were going to be called in the future, right? So. They called them network access points. A network access point was a place where network service providers, internet service providers, would come together to exchange traffic. And as part of the transition plan, they provided some funding to help get the first few network access points, internet exchange points, uh, transitioned over to private sector operation. So there were five network access points that were funded by the US government initially. And that contract was for network access points. Since then, uh, internet exchange points have come to be called internet exchange points. Uh, but in Latin America, NAP, NAP, has been a more popular and more common term. So in Latin America, you, you see them referred to as NAPs more. And in most of the rest of the world, you see them referred to as IXPs or IXs. Um, this, is that a Spanish language acronym thing? Is it more? No, it was a. Um, choice that was made in the past and that's the concept the NAP was more welcome, you know. Yeah. Uh, that's, 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 I think basically it's the same. Same, same thing. Yeah, it's just different word for the same thing. Yeah. Um, the other question, how are exchange points connected with each other? Uh, the only way exchange points are connected is through internet service providers. So an internet service provider would connect to multiple exchange points. but. Economically, there is no mechanism for any individual packet to ever travel through more than one exchange point because there's a chain of money that follows the delivery of a packet. And if I'm a customer and I want to deliver a packet, I have to pay for transit to make that happen. And there's a chain of people paying for transit up to the point at which there's a peering session. And then the peering breaks that chain. And then there's another chain coming up from the other side. So the peering point, the exchange point, is at the middle of that, and there's no money that crosses that point. Money comes up towards that point from both sides, but runs out before it gets there. So there's no way for a packet to ever cross two exchange points, or any reason for you to want a packet to cross two exchange points, because the money will have already run out by the time it gets to the first exchange point. There's no one with a business case for moving traffic between two exchange points, because how would you get paid? somebody else's customer paying on each side. There's no business case for doing it. The people whose customers it are, they'll take care of that because they're being paid for it. So that's that one. Uh, and then, yeah. Well, recently I've been reading about something called Kaminsky attacks. <laughs> Very <Where it's free. laughs> Uh, where it's pretty easy to basically fool a DNS server into faking a DNS request and sending it to a Fisher site or any hacker site. Now, obviously, there are hacks available for it, but who is responsible for ensuring that all the ISPs or other NOCs are, you know, fixing up those things so that any customer coming to my site to provide me financial data is not fished or anything? It's really the response, I mean, there, the Kaminsky attack, ha, uh, well, it's referred to the Kaminsky attack. Uh, Dan Kaminsky discovered uh, or found a really fast way to implement um, 
uh, a way to fool um, DNS resolvers, things that actually do the lookup, okay, uh, to uh, accept false data. To answer your question directly, it is up to the people running the, the ISPs running the re, their DNS resolver. So in the picture that I showed earlier where you ask your ISP's DNS server um, for an IP address, it's up to the ISP to apply whatever patches, which are not perfect, okay, to that server uh, to, to discourage the Kaminsky attack. The real solution, of course, is going to be something called DNSSEC. Um, in that whole description of DNS, DNS is, is not a secured protocol at all. It's all done in clear text. It's open. Um, and there's no way to, um, it, it, the way it's implemented now, there's no way to check to see if the response is, in fact, hasn't been tampered with. DNSSEC will fix that, and that's something that we're all in the process of trying to get deployed now. Well, I think the Swedes have already, uh, they have already uh, rolled out DNSSEC, right? Yes, so they have. So what's stopping the French and the others from doing it? Um, Bureaucracy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, personally, I, I, I don't see what's, what's stopping them. But, but realistically, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, as Bill said, there's some bureaucracy. 